we are the church gathering. And we say that this morning because uh, as we are uh, going over uh, with our virtual, uh, we know that you gather throughout the day. And so uh, we are coming together as our church. But the church is together. This is what we do and what we're about. This morning as we are, I want us to think for a few minutes, Christ is the key. Christ is the key in Scripture. Uh, key verse will come out of 1 Timothy 4.12. It's been a long several weeks lately as we've watched the turmoil in our country uh, coming from uh, the political systems, the riots, uh, beginning and going through the cities, moving on into Washington, as we question, in reality, uh, what what are we doing as we vote and what we're about? As we look at COVID, as it continues to be around us and continue uh, to see people around us that we lose because of it, constant turmoil. But you know, this is not the first time there's been constant turmoil and the lives of God's people. As Paul is writing to Timothy, it's tough times. It was in Rome. Rome was a totalitarian state. The Caesars were in charge and they let it be known. And Timothy was trying to operate within that. Paul was in prison as he writes, as he shared. And as he does, he's coming back to say unto Timothy, Timothy, you've got to remember the key to all of this is Jesus Christ. As I was uh, studying this week and thinking and, and reading, as I looked at it, there's a reminder in there to who we are and what we're about. A reminder that part of the problem within our nation today is the fact the church has not been what it should be. The church has not reached out. It's not really made the difference. Last week we talked about what God intended with his church. How he began it with the power of the Spirit as he sent the Holy Spirit in. How he moved on and said the key is going to be the fellowship, what you do together. And then he's saying if you're going to make a difference, you live it out in faith. That was what it was all about. This week, What's taking place is Paul's writing to Timothy. And he's saying, God established the church, but the key is in individuals. What are we doing? What difference are we making? A church can only become a source of God's blessing as his people do the work, as they reach out, as they make a difference. So what does this mean to us as individuals? What does it do? It relates to us how we're supposed to respond to the things about us. What God has called us to do. We have to remind ourselves and I try to and I keep it before us. We are the hands and feet of Jesus today. We are the ones that make things happen. We're the ones that can make a difference in what goes on and what's taking place. Do you ever stop and think about what difference you're making? What's going on? One of the things that Marlene and I learned as I worked for the uh, convention there in Mississippi was uh, we were probably in uh, 14, 1,500 churches during the time that we were there. Every church has its own unique personality. And what is that personality built on? It's built on the way that the people in that church relate to God and what they do. And whether it's a loving, caring fellowship, whether it's one that's cold, and, uh, really doesn't pay a lot of attention, they come together, they meet, and nothing much happens from that. What I want you to think about this morning is what is our church doing and what we do as individuals? And a reminder, Christ is the key. You heard the music a few moments ago. Keep me near the cross. The secret of everything we are is how close we stay to the cross, how close we stay to Jesus in what we do. And I remind you again, 
It all ends with each one of us. It's not them, it's me that makes the difference. I was thinking as I was studying this week, remembering some of the folks that I've known and had been related to during seminary times and, and all of those, some interesting individuals, people that were Christian, but for a long time ran from what God wanted them to do. Had two good friends. One of them that I traveled to seminary with, the other one was a pastor that was a dear friend of mine and what we did. They were knew that God wanted them to do something, but they ran a long time. They both were carpenters. Sounds for me, doesn't it? That's what Jesus did. They were carpenters. They were builders. But along in the process, God kept talking to them about something different, about the fact he wanted them to be more than just ordinary Christians. He wanted them to be ministers. And so about their mid-40s, they both surrendered the ministry. They went back to school. They went back to school to learn because they remembered this verse that we began with, with this morning. 1 Timothy 4, 12. And it reads, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. What's he saying? He's saying, Timothy, God has a special place for you. You're to spread his word. So what have you got to do to do that? First of all, you've got to know it. You've got to understand his word. You've got to be so into it that you can bring out the meaning that Jesus gave to us and live it before others. Live it in the way you walk and you love and everything about you. That's what you could do. And that's what these two individuals finally accepted that God wanted them to take his word and live it. And they did something that many times people fail to do. Even ministers. They decided that they were going to do that they wanted to be the best about it. And so they went. They studied. They worked. They wanted to make sure when they stood before the people that they were teaching exactly what Jesus wanted them to teach. They put their work, their efforts into it. They were doing all these things. So what is our job as individuals? Our job as Christians is to know what we believe. One of the first awakenings that I had was before I went to seminary to study. It was with a, a minister and with one of the teachers from that group. And was, I questioned him about, would your beliefs change? He said, made a statement. He said, son, if you're not grounded in your faith, you have no business in thinking about seminary and especially about thinking about being a minister. Know what you believe. Know it well enough that nothing is going to change that relationship with Jesus Christ. We're taught, as uh, Paul writes to the, the church of Corinth, we're taught that we all have gifts. And these gifts are there to build the church of Jesus Christ. That's what they're about. That's who we are. The question is, are we using these gifts in such a way that we're actually doing that building? Paul takes time as he writes to Timothy, his son in the faith. His son in the faith. He's the one that had really influenced the life of Timothy so much. He's saying to him, Timothy, there are hard days ahead of them. There are going to be things that are going to shake the ground that you walk on. It may be in your government. It may be in your life. It may be in what you face. It may be in the fact you're attacked for your belief. But stand strong. Stand strong in your faith and know what you believe and live. Never has there been a time that our people have 
and they need to be strong in their faith in right now. Know what you believe. Don't listen to what's coming over the news and saying, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. What you've got to do is live for Jesus. Stay in that cross. Walk in it. That's what's important. Know his word. Know what it says. Know the scriptures. Because we see them attacked all the time. We are told today that, uh, you know, there are a lot of different faiths. You can't, you can't just hold one up. Jesus said one thing. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes except by him. That says to me, this is the only faith. This is the only teaching that he has. This is what it's about. He says to Timothy, be an example. He says, Timothy, you're young. That doesn't make any difference. Know what you believe and teach what you believe. Teach what's there. Understand it. Teach it in such a way that people can hear and understand and know. One of the things that we saw developing during the time and across the years as I worked with ministers, ministers getting to the point of saying, I, I, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I want a 40-day week and all of that. God calls you to live your faith 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Doesn't mean you don't have time to rest, but it means that there comes a sacrifice in that. But what does he say to lay people? He says to lay people, we need to live in such a way that people see Jesus in us and what we're about. Had a dear friend in college. He was a great guy. When he finished high school, he was drafted by a professional baseball team. I think it was Orioles at the time. Given a good, he was going to be given a good uh, signing bonus, had everything there. And he said, Jim, I thought about it. I looked at it. And I really wanted, I loved baseball. He said, you know, I knew something. I knew that if I surrendered to that, that I would never take my stand to serve God in the way that he called me to. I would let it become the thing that totally controlled my life. And he said, I turned my back on it and I walked away. Because I believe that God had something different for me. He didn't become a minister. He was lame. He became a hospital administrator. And in that job, probably touched as many lives for Christ. He was talking to them constantly. He was working with people, but he was sharing with them the power that Jesus could make within their lives. I was with him in one of our big youth camps. He had brought in a group of young people. And he set an example for them. He was still young enough. He could still play, play baseball. He could still play uh, with them. He was out there with them. He showed them how to do it. But most of all, he showed them how to live for Jesus. That's what it was all about. That's what he was doing. That's what he was helping take place in a lost world. God is saying to us, whether you're a minister, whether you're a lay person, whatever you are, live for Jesus. Put him first. Let him be the key to everything you do. Everything that's about you. Second thing he reminds us is, he says, Never neglect your gifts. Because if you neglect the gifts that God has given you, they can be taken away from you. You ever stop and think about that? We talk about a giftedness, giftedness for serving God, but they can be taken away. I was in a revival 
one night with a young lady and she got up to give her testimony. And she shared that God had blessed her with a beautiful voice. She loved to sing. And she sang in church on Sunday, but she also found she, uh, that she used a voice for other things. And she started on Saturday night going out. I was singing at some of the dives around because she liked to sing that kind of music too. And she said God kept trying to move her back and said, I didn't listen. He said, I got up to sing one Sunday morning. He said, I had no voice. I couldn't carry a tune. She said, God took the voice he gave me away. The gift that I had. He said, now all I can do is share my testimony about it. Because she said, if you have a gift that God's given you for a purpose, and you don't use it, he'll take it away from you. He'll remove it from you. Have you ever thought about that? One of the great things that uh, in the work that I did for the years in Mississippi was to work with laymen. Great folks. Great folks that were gifted in so many ways. But you know what they had done? The ones that I got to work with. They realized they had a gift. And they were making a living out of it. But they never shortchanged God on using it for them. One was a contractor. Great guy. He and his wife. They did more for missions in our state probably than any of the missionaries did. They were constantly going somewhere. Constantly building churches. Sharing their faith in all they did. They worked with the youth. They told them what they could do. And they encouraged them to live their faith as they worked on people's houses and touched lives and made a difference. Had engineers that worked with us. They had made their living as engineers, but they took all their spare time to live out their faith and use those talents for the things around them. They built. One guy that uh, he was Old enough, he was in the CDs, World War II. He was there. But he came out and he lived his faith. He built churches all over the United States. They were in the groundwork of it. That's what their life was about. They used their talents. They used their gifts. Are you using your gift that God has given you for him? Are you taking it and touching people's lives? And in the process of helping them when you share the love of Jesus with them. Paul's telling Timothy to write as you continue first and second Timothy, especially in Second Timothy. He said, Timothy, my time will soon be over. Are you ready to take my place? Are you ready to accept? responsibility that God's given you. Are you ready to live it out? That's what Paul was doing. He was training Timothy to stand in his place. You as a Christian today, who are you training to take your place when you're gone? Is it your kids? Is it friends? Is it someone around you? Our responsibility is to constantly be living our faith but be training those that come behind you to be strong in what you do. And finally, as he talks to Timothy on down in the scripture there, you'll find uh, he tells him not, not to neglect his gift, but he says, be strong in the grace that comes from Christ Jesus. Live it out. Live it out. He's saying, Jesus and that grace that he brought. That's the key to everything we do. It's everything about us. Over in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 2, he comes back and he talks again to Timothy. And he reminds him in what he says. And the, he, again, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things thou hast heard me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men 
we shall be able to teach others also. What's he saying to Timothy? He's saying, Timothy, your responsibility never stops. It's living the faith. It's teaching the faith because you're preparing the future of what's going to happen and what will take place. What will happen in our nation depends on what we do today. Are we going to live out our faith? Are we going to share? Are we going to be telling others uh, what is going on? Are we going to remind them it's not what the government does, it's what we do through God and touch our nation? Our nation was founded as a Christian nation. People can say what they want to, but to go back to the study, to read, they'll find that each one of these men that looked at they looked at finding it as a Christian nation. The problem is our nation's forgotten who they are. They've forgotten the king. And they need to stop and remember one thing. When Israel turned away from God, God ended them. We need to remember the power of our nation depends on what we do for Jesus. And if it's not there, there will be nothing. God never forgets those who love his grace and share it where they go. I was thinking, we just finished up Lottie Moon's season. Lottie Moon was a woman who loved to give away the grace of Jesus. She did it wherever she was able to go. And at a time in which women were not allowed to do much in missions at all, especially if they were single, Lottie moved to China to live out of faith. She worked with the children. She worked with the ladies. The ones that the men couldn't even reach. They couldn't even talk to. She stood strong in the grace for them. And what a difference she made. She changed her world there. She changed our world. Because we realize that in the mission offering made for that over a billion dollars has been given to do missions. If we live our faith, we continue to have an influence down through the kingdom. That's what it's all about. That's what we are. One writer who was reading this week made this statement. The more we immerse ourselves in grace, the more likely we are to give grace away. The more we understand and live in the grace of Jesus Christ, the more we have to give away. I read you again some this week. I like to look back at Bill Graham's sermons. Some of the things that he said and what he did. As I looked at it, I saw one thing come out. His message was always simple. But it was always honest. He began by saying, you can be forgiven. No matter what you can do, you can be forgiven. Your life can be remade if you let Jesus do it. And he said, ultimately, there's something else you need to remember. You're going to spend eternity in one of two places. It's not an option. He didn't mind saying that. He didn't mind being honest. But you either accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and spend eternity in heaven, or you deny doing your own thing and spend, spend eternity in hell. A simple message, but one that reminds us Jesus came in grace. He came in grace to change us, to give us opportunity. To live for him. Have you accepted that this morning? Have you found that grace? Do you understand Jesus when he takes over your life and he gives you forgiveness? If you haven't, this is the time to do it. Because the alternative to that is not very pleasant. But he would have said, spend eternity in heaven, not in hell. That's what we're all about. And so what's the message this morning? Then we look at one simple thing. Jesus 
It's the key. Jesus is the key to all things. All that we do. All that we live. Are you living for him this morning? Are you letting him be the key to your life and make the difference? So that when you're out in the world, you're moving through the church to share his message wherever you go. I challenge you to do that this week. Let's pray again. Father, as we come this morning, we come understanding your love and knowing that you want to touch our lives and make a difference within us. You want us to make us alive in your faith. Father, help us to accept that grace and live that grace. Help us to be an example to the world about us. We hear the music playing, Lord.